Well, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, the title of um, this second contribution to this series of uh, seminars probably may have uh, surprised some of you. I will spend some time today talking about this terminology. Terminology, yes. Why? Well, it's not only my opinion, some say it's my obsession, but that of many British investigators. It's our opinion that terminology is more important than usually we thought. And certainly, yes, spending time in clarifying what do we mean when we say risk instability will never be a waste of time, in my opinion. But before getting into it, uh, let me acknowledge my friend, my good friend, my mentor and senior partner, Alberto Lucomedes. His many contributions in the field of uh, terminology has inspired most of us uh, so much. And, and I would say that almost everything I'm going to say today, it's thanks to Albert. So thank you, Alberto. Let's start by a clinical case that demonstrates the need for using right terminology in clinical practice. After a mild wrist sprain, this 57-year-old carpenter experienced pain, swelling, and functional loss. The x-rays obtained at that time disclosed that both the escape lunate angle and the escape lunate gap were not normal. No further studies were requested because, according to his clinical records, it was an obvious case of escape lunate instability. So the patient was scheduled for surgery the same week. Surgery was disappointing, however. The scaphoid was found dorsally subluxed and hardly reducible, with a seriously damaged proximal pole of the, of the cartilage. And yes, there were big gaps. But the wrist was not unstable. It was malaligned and stiff, but not unstable, the case. Where's the problem? Inexperience of the surgeon? Poor judgment of the, of the surgeon? Misleading terminology? Not long ago, uh, Vivian Lee is one of the finest uh, plastic surgeons I know from UK, warned us about the risks of uh, misleading terminology. Terminology, she said, has the power of shaping our thoughts. And if our basic concepts are wrong, we'll probably describe the pathology incorrectly. And the surgical solutions devised to help our patients may not always work. Misleading terminology, that's a problem. But also it's a problem, the accumulation of unnecessary terminology. And that's another. Don't you feel discouraged every time you look at the Tower of Babel of risk pathology? That many neologisms, that many acronyms were really necessary. Let's concentrate on the term instability my subject today. When was first used? What was the meaning back then? Well, Etienne de Stowe from Dijon, uh, born in Dijon, but later on professor of uh, radiology in Lyon, France, was the first to describe a case where scaphoid and lunet were separated from each other. It was in the book uh, Traumatisme de Poignet, Rayon Six, of 1923, as, as early as that. He did not use the word instability, but the more descriptive term of subluxation, which is fine to me. The first to use the term instability, referred to the wrist, was Professor Constantin Lambrinudi from the Guy's Hospital in London. The scaphoid uh, behaves, he said, like a bridge between two rows ensuring harmony and stability to the carpus. To him, uh, stability was only a bone-related problem. No mention was made uh, back then about ligament ruptures. Um, the concept, in fact, of a skiffle ligament instability related to ligament ruptures 
was introduced in 1972 by Robinson Lindsay from the Mayo Clinic. From their seminal study, we learned that breast instability and breast malalignment were somehow interconnected. Two major groups of misalignment were analyzed, the DZ misalignment and the VZ misalignment, that at the time were known as dorsal intercalated segment instability, understood as intercalated segment dolunate, and then the ball intercalated segment instability, also dolunate that it's twisted into flexion as opposed to the uh, DC that was uh, uh, rotated into extension. We also learned that the uh, carpal misalignment may result from ligament rupture, of course, but also from joint incongruity, from unresolved fractures, from an alteration of the size and shape of the joints involved, etc. Certainly, the term instability should not be used to name one specific condition, but to name a risk symptom characterized by pain, weakness, and loss of carpal alignment, whatever the cause. It's not a condition. Whenever you say, I have a case of uh, carpal instability, you, you are not saying enough. There are several problems with the view. While ligament related instabilities are not always aligned, not always misaligned. I mean, I mean, uh, there are so many things that didn't didn't work fine. This house of cars, for instance, is well aligned and yet is unstable. The paradox is that after collapsing, all cars will become stable again, but misaligned. So just the opposite that we have seen before. Indeed, couple alignment and stability are complementary concepts, but not synonymous. A concept that was often forgotten, as you may see in this recent publication, where it says, clearly, instability and malalignment are still said to be equivalent terms, and they are not. That's why I think that we should insist on that. Well, when carpal collapse has dissociated bones from the same row, the case is called carpal instability dissociative or SIT. If the dysfunction does not affect bones from the same row, that's carpal instability non-dissociative. By combining the direction of malrotation and the type of predominant dysfunction, several patterns of carpal instability have been described. Carpal instability dissociative DC, Sit in BC, Sint and Ute, uh, Sit, I mean, the Tower of Babel of this pathology again. Not to mention the theology, because the theology is another factor. Depending upon what uh, the theology, uh, whether it's the origin of the stabilizing program, there are congenital instabilities, trauma related instabilities, and disease related instabilities. I don't know you, but, but I think that this is uh, ridiculously complicated and should not be that complicated. Not there have been, um, not there have uh, not been attempts to explain instability. Many authors try to explain instability. Most of them fail to get their ideas through. In that sense, I would like to mention the EIFSSH position statement published in 1999. It was in the Genval meeting, Genval uh, near Brussels, organized by Schwinn, uh, Frederick Schwinn, in the Genval meeting of 1992, the International Hand and Bridge Biomechanics Group was asked to discuss and decide how to define instability. There were three major opinions. Some investigators believe the term stable to derive from the verb to stand, that he is not likely to fall, that he is capable of bearing loads. Accordingly, a joint should only be considered stable if it was able to sustain physiologic loads. A second group felt that the term stability derived from the verb to stay, that is, resistant to sudden change. Something that it's not sporadic, but permanent is, according to this view, stable. 
in that sense, the presence of a clunk or a snap or any form, any other form of painful dyskinematics was taken as a sign of instability. The third group believed that no matter how, any alteration of the carpal alignment was or had been unstable. Well, as these things are slow usually, we met several times, but it was not until 1998, during the meeting in Vancouver, that we finally agreed in combining the three ideas in one single document published the year after. According to that document, when a stable wrist is actually loaded, all bones move within normal limits, all joints, contacts, occur across cartilage cover surfaces, and all bones tend to recover their initial alignment as soon as the wrist is unloaded. Conversely, a wrist should be considered unstable when if it's unable to be a physiologic load without giving way. If carpal displacements do trespass normal limits, and bones cannot be easily reduced from its displaced position. In other words, you had to have a kinematic dysfunction, a kinetic dysfunction, and a demonstrable misalignment to claim that the bridge was unstable according to the 1999 consensus document. It's very complicated, wasn't it? Well, um, and that's the problem. I mean, I guess that part of the problem in that attempt to define stability was not the concept of stability itself, but our different professional backgrounds. It's like the parable of six blind men describing an elephant. We describe the stability each of us from a different perspective. I was a hand surgeon, so I was uh, offering my vision that was different from the orthopedic Surgeon, different from the, the biomechanical uh, engineering, etc. That was it. I mean, uh, there were too many perspectives, and we were left aside into that. Um, I think that backgrounds aside, let's see if we can find a satisfactory answer to the question what is unstable and what is not. I think that we should do it. I mean, uh, we need it. As intuitive as you want. But you all agree with me that this Roman arch, which by the way is in Tarragona, is remarkably uh, stable. It was built centuries ago, and yet it resists load without collapsing. This wooden column to the left is stable, and the one to the right is not. So far, so good. Human towers are, by definition, unstable, even if perfectly aligned, also in Tarragona, this case. The opposite can be said about the Leaning Tower of Pisa in Italy. It certainly means a line tower, and yet it's as stable as most, all, uh, as most towers uh, will. This one, by contrast, was so unstable that had to be demolished for safety reasons. What really matters here is not the overall alignment of the building, but the status of all elements that provide the stability to the building. It's not about the alignment, but about the risk of collapsing what makes a building stable or not. Let's apply these concepts to the risk. If the scaphoid cannot resist loads without subluxing, that wrist is unstable. However, if the scaphoid did collapse some time ago and could not be easily reduced now, and that wrist should not be considered unstable, it's a stiff wrist and has different treatment and worse prognosis than if it was just unstable. Because instability is not a disease. Instability is a symptom. When the patient says, my wrist gives way, doctor, and when he does, it hurts a lot, the patient is telling you that probably he has a wrist instability. 
Of course, patients do not care about um, do not care much about uh, the size of the skin for makeup. The only thing they can say is that something is wrong in the wrist, and that's a symptom again. Certain instability is not a sign that can be measured in millimeters of gap in this case, or it's not can be cannot be measured in degrees of misalignment. What about carp and clunking? What about breeze these kinematics? Is that clunking a symptom that indicates instability? Well, maybe it is, but not always. Only a few may be considered unstable, but not because they are clunking. If they are unstable, it's because they cannot bear physiologic loads without yielding. And in my opinion, that's the key. The key is that all those problems should not be called carpal instability. They should call, be called carpal dysfunctions, as indeed they all share the fact of having an alteration of what we consider normal function. Dysfunctions, as you know, may be kinetic or kinematic. We have described that the last week. And if the problem implies a loss of ability of the sustained loads, the patient has a kinetic dysfunction. If the case implies the presence of sudden and unexpected changes in carpal alignment, that case is a kinematic problem. And needless to say that kinematic problem may or may not be unstable. That's why we have these two Venn diagrams, these Venn diagrams that correspond to cases of instability and have clunking will uh, be placed in the middle of them. In fact, the clunking case that we have just seen before is one case of this kinematics that is not unstable. It's not unstable. Why do I know? Because, uh, well, it's a friend of mine and uh, there was a big clunk, but no yielding problems when carrying load. So if there is no kinetic problem, he cannot be unstable. And yet he has a clunk. So clunking would be this kinematics. Instability in this case would be this kinetic. With time, all those um, dysfunctions sooner or later will develop permanent carpal misalignment. And with time, those misalignments may evolve into carpal stiffness. A stiff bridge, however, will rarely be unstable. We have been discussing that with David not uh, before this talk. The patient may or may not have symptoms. Symptoms will vary with time. First will be in the form of unstable wrist, acute pain, probably, inflammation, probably, until it collapses. And then slowly, but it will become a stiff with chronic discomfort, ankylosis. Of course, once a, a, a stiff wrist may not be unstable. And stable wrist where may become a stiffness. So, in a way, we are trying to say that uh, one, you have reached the summit. The patient will have to descend to the left and require treatment to stabilize his unstable wrist or to the right and require treatment for stiffness. Patients cannot descend in both directions at the same time because a joint may be unstable or stiff, but not both. I think that this sentence is the one that uh, captures the meaning, the, the true meaning of my talk today. Next question. Is there a relationship between wrist injury and time elapse since the accident? Is an unstable wrist always unstable? These are the typical patients for us. A young male who has suffered a violent twist to his wrist while participating in a cycling race. Not just a hyperextension injury. He had a combined axial load extension and violent rotation of the falling body about the fixed hand on the floor. The scaphoid has been pulled into extension by the two mid-carpal crossing ligaments, STT and SC ligaments, whereas the lunate has stayed behind, constrained by the palmar ligaments. And such violent torque at the scaphoid level results in, resulted in the rupture of the palmar scaphoid ligament first, 
complete tearing of the proximal membrane second, and a rupture of the dorsal scaphoidal ligament lastly. Let's imagine that you convince him to get that raised scope and you know that uh, he's got uh, all the scapegoat ligaments rupture. Well, uh, with the three component rupture, however, he does not feel unstable and that's not unusual. I mean, most of these, they don't have anything uh, important to show just after the accident. Initially, imaging does not show gaps, no misalignment, and probably they, they come to you uh, urging you to say that uh, they may uh, go back to see cycling as soon as possible. What would you tell him? He should be aware, he should be told that the chances will be for his wrist to deteriorate with that. If he keeps cycling before his injuries have been treated, he will degenerate. He should be aware also that the secondary carpal stabilizers will elongate and the wrist will start giving way. It'll take some time for the carpals to collapse and if he keeps uh, cycling, that will happen. And will happen because sooner or later, the secondary stabilizers will start falling. And when they do, that will be the moment of maximal instability. Once collapsed, the bones will readjust to their sublux position, and the stems of all torn ligaments will retract, making very difficult the reconstruction. As the wrist becomes stiffer, the empty spaces will be filled with fibrosis, all capsules will contract, and all ranges of motion will start decreasing. In the final stages, the cartilages will degenerate following a specific pattern, the so-called ruscafulinate advanced collapse, slack brace, yes. Or that all that uh, should know, that cyclists before this deciding his future, but of course, the real question regarding stability would be, should all unstable wrists be treated right away? I mean, is there an urgent in, an, in the emergency room uh, should be treated right away? Of course, my answer to that question depends on several factors. In general, I like to say that it is during the storm that the sailing boat becomes unstable. It is then when the, sable, the sailor needs help. If you wait a little bit for the storm to subside, it may be too late. In other words, there is a window of opportunity to get the unstable escape nate joint back to normal. Usually that opportunity appears before the carpus collapses, or oh, just after that, provided that the displaced scape with an lunator is irreducible. Again, the word kit is irreducible. Well, and how to know that there is a scape dysfunction that needs to be treated? Um, well, this is the case of an acute uh, scape dissociation. Um, in 2005, we proposed an algorithm of treatment that was based on five questions, each addressing one of the variables that we thought important at the time. In 2014, we realized that there was another variable that had been missed until the program. So we added the sixth question to this algorithm. The first question has to do with the severity of the injury. Is there a partial ligament rupture? Which portion has been left intact? Are ligaments only stretch out or completely torn? In this regard, the algorithm proposed by the I, I was the International Research Thoroscopy Society, helps answering this question. And certainly, this is the type of question that requires a good expertise in arthroscopy. The second question is about repairability. If both volar and dorsal ligaments are torn, can them be repaired? Have their stems good healing potential? 
And this is a work by Johnny Anderson in his recent doctoral thesis. According to him, there are four types of scaphoidal ligament rupture. Type three, which corresponds to mid-substance rupture, is the one with the poorest prognosis. All other types are avulsions and probably will heal if reattached, or if reattached properly and early enough. Third question is, if cannot be repaired, are the secondary stabilizers still able to maintain normal copper alignment? Let's not forget what we said uh, the last week. Behind a massive carpal collapse, not only, not only the, um, the escape lunar ligaments need to be completely torn, but also the secondary STT and SC stabilizers need to be stretched out to allow the carpal collapse. To know that, we usually assess the risk scape with angle, and if it's inferior to 45 degrees, it probably means rupture, the secondary stabilizers. But again, most of these uh, numbers, or these figures, are wrong. Uh, so probably uh, it's arthroscopy. Another parameter to study is radial lunate stability. Does the lunate maintain a normal relationship with the radius? It is not really the same, an isolated scaphalonate rupture, than a rupture of both radiolunate and scaphalonate ligaments. In the first, the radiocarpal joint is stable, whereas in the second, there is subluxation of the lunate towards the ulna, this requiring much more aggressive treatment. Be careful, therefore. You see the gap, and sometimes you should look at the relationship between the between the radius and, and lunate and the lunate being translocated along it. The fifth question is about reducibility. How much force is needed to correct the alignment of the displaced bones? If there are calcifications in the stems of the rupture ligaments, fibrosis in the joints, or bone deformity, very seldom the joint will be easily reducible. For a repair to succeed, you must make sure that all bones are easily reducible. And finally, the status of cartilage is also important. Is there a cartilage effect, any condolences, etc. So based on this, and now yeah, you know this, yeah, we assign to all these questions a yes or no answer. We may differentiate up to seven stages of this post-traumatic problem that you may see. The number of no answers increases from left to right, and this indicates the progression of the problem with that. From partial ligament ruptures to complete ligament ruptures, but, uh, but uh, repairable, uh, non-repairable scaphoidal ligament ruptures, normal angles, that means the radius scaphoidal angle is normal. A carpal collapse will be the fourth, uh, the fourth stage, easily reducible. Lunate is stable still. In this case, uh, differentiate fourth and five because the lunate are unstable. That means that the lunate is translocated. And then we have the carpal collapse, uh, reducible carpal collapse, and finally, non reducible uh, slack risk pathology. On theory, patients in the same stage of the disease would require similar treatment. But this, I think that we should stop here because uh, this will be the subject of one of the next uh, webinars that we'll have, uh, I believe, on October the 12th, and it will be given by my, my friend Alex Liu. So thank you very much. Uh,